Hi class, this is Dr. Heather Austin Robillard, and this lecture video is going to be about assessment of eating disorders. Throughout this class thus far, you have learned about the different types of eating disorders, those that are diagnosable, and the subtypes of those diagnoses. In this lecture video, we're going to talk about how do we assess for these types of eating disorders among individuals, and how does this assessment influence treatment? First, let's talk about what assessment is. Assessment is defined as the initial stage of treatment. We must assess the individual before we can actually treat them. Assessment follows the gathering of information. We find out what information we need to know in order to assess them for the appropriate diagnosis that then leads to treatment. So again, assessment is part of treatment. Assessment helps the professionals gather the information obtaining to how to understand the problem of their eating disorder, diagnosing, the severity of their problem, any psychological complications or medical issues, risk factors or red flag issues like are they suicidal or homicidal, and it allows you to build rapport with the client um, or the patient. In order to conduct an assessment, we need to understand that there are multiple methods and multiple sources for assessment. If we spend too much time or too little time on assessment, this can be unhelpful or even unethical, especially towards their treatment. Screening are short questionnaires that might add data for assessment. The assessment is also an interview process, so we're screening them but also interviewing them to understand their symptoms and their history. Another important component of assessment is to assess for their readiness of change. Are they in denial? Are they in pre-contemplation? Or are they ready to take action in their treatment? As you may have already learned, the stages of change are De Clemente and Prochaska's um, stages of change. And this means that they're at pre-contemplation and then they move to contemplation and then they start preparing for action and then they maintain their change and then they could have recovery or they could have relapse, which starts the stages of change all over again. Now, while this is a linear stage model of change, they can jump to different stages within. Um, so relapse may not start all the way the, at the beginning to pre-contemplation, but they may end up starting at contemplation after their relapse. It just depends on the individual's cognition and behavior. So one piece of assessment is gathering demographic information. We need to know their name, their age, what their career is or occupation, uh, their relationship status, their sexual orientation. These presentation, um, certain presentations about them, how do they look? How are they dressed? What is their emotional affect? These are all important pieces to understand in the interview process and can help greatly when assessing them for treatment. We also want to assess what is their reason for seeking treatment? Why now in particular? Did they decide to come to treatment or was were they coerced? Was it somebody gave them an ultimatum to come to treatment? Do they need immediate treatment? Like, are there red flag issues like suicidality or they're about to die from malnutrition? Are there certain side effects from their eating disorder? Is there self-harm? All of these things need to be um, assessed for or screened for when deciding what the appropriate treatment is for them. Some other important areas to assess for are what is the chief complaint? Sometimes people aren't even coming into therapy or into treatment for their eating disorder. They might be coming in for marital distress or for some kind of medical issue. So we need to know what their chief complaint is. We need to understand their psychiatric history. Do they have any kind of mental diagnoses that might need to be um, treated concurrently? What is their medical history? Are there certain medical issues because of their eating disorder or even not related to it? Their psychological history, have they received treatment or therapy before? Are they currently using or have used substances that might be abusive and need to be treated concurrently with their eating disorder as well? Another common thing to assess for is sexual or physical abuse or ne neglect. 
in the initial assessment process, this may not always be revealed at first, but we still need to assess for it. Another important component of assessment is their family dynamics, different family patterns about health, food, weight, and exercise. Do they have support systems or personal goals? And then, of course, what is the, their motivation and the motivation of the family members or those close to them? So there are different types of assessment. One is screening. The screening questionnaires basically ask certain questions to see if there's even an issue that might be present. If there is, then we might want to find out the diagnosis. Um, so these are the DSM diagnosis and criteria that they might meet. Another assessment is a medical assessment. What are their medical symptoms from their diagnoses or other health risks and complications? Then there's a nutritional assessment where we're identifying what does their current diet look like and are they uh, missing certain nutritional um, vitamins or deficiencies. Then there's a family assessment. This is where we might ask about their family or even ask questions of their family to understand more information about the, the patient or the client. There's a body image assessment. This helps us identify do they have certain fears around body image and shape or do they have, do any of their um, eating behaviors rely because of their body image? There's an assessment for comorbid issues. This is, helps us determine other areas that might impact their treatment, like if they have bipolar disorder or a substance use disorder. When we're looking at assessments specifically for eating disorder behavior, it's important to do a face-to-face -face interview because we can pick up more details in this. We want to make sure we're creating a safe place for the individual so they feel like they can be honest. And this also helps build rapport, which helps people be honest with the, the answers of the interview process. We need to be detailed with your questions. So instead of saying, do you ever restrict your food or do you restrict your food? Instead of saying something broad like that, you can say, how many times do you restrict your food a week? one to two times or six to seven times. Being specific helps them narrow down their answers instead of a general or vague answer. And we also want to actively listen rather than just listening until we can talk or also reflecting back what we hear when we're listening. Another piece of assessing for eating disorders is using paper and pencil assessments. These can be quick and feasible and many assessments are available for anorexia and bulimia nervosa. Um, however, there's limited assessments for other diagnosable eating disorders. These paper and pencil assessments are often used in clinical settings and for research. And the relay, they rely on the awareness and honesty of the client, which is why sometimes interviewing family can help us understand what the client is actually doing and experiencing. Some examples that we can use for uh, screening and assessing for eating disorders. One screener is an eating, the EAT test, which is only 26 questions and helps assess whether or screen for if there's some type of eating, ish, eating disorder issue. And then if we're diagnosing, we can use the eating disorder diagnostic scale. For a structured interview, we would use the eating disorder examination. And then there's also the body image assessment or the BIA. When using a medical assessment, we're looking for a few things. First, when looking at a low weight patient, we want to complete a blood count. Uh, we want to understand their electrolyte battery, an electrocardiogram to look at their heart, liver function, and the DXA. The DXA measures their bone density to see if there's any osteoporosis in them. Uh, with patients who have purging behaviors, we want to again look at their electrolytes, uh, do a dental evaluation to see if there's any erosion in their dental from purging. In obese patients with any kind of binge behaviors, we want to identify any possible heart disease or diabetes. And patients with who are in recovery, we still want to look for any long-term effects of their eating disorder, like osteoporosis or heart disease, and sometimes even fertility so As issues. we've talked about family assessment, the goal of a family assessment is to engage the family in the treatment process. It also obtains a history of the eating disorder and how it's affected the family. And we can gain preliminary information about the functioning of the family. 
Are there coalitions or triangulations? Uh, what does the structure look like? And how do they um, handle conflict in the family? These can also these can all be important components of assessing the family dynamics, which do help us understand the individual's eating behaviors. We're also looking for certain patterns. How do they interact and express emotion in the family? What does flexibility look like? Is it easy to switch roles within families or is it very rigid? Sensitivity, are there concerns or support? Are they able to validate each other? Is there any kind of outside support? Um, groups, churches, spouses, friendships? Is there performance of developmentally appropriate tasks? Um, are they, is the patient able to be independent or is there too much independence depending on their developmental level? And what is their family's knowledge of the illness? Sometimes families come in and they don't even understand what an eating disorder is. So it's important to assess, do they even have knowledge of the disease of this or do they think it's a moral thing? Um, we want to know what their knowledge is and so we can decide where the where we need to start with education. If a patient is an adult and living away from the family of origin, or maybe they're married, we need to look for any kind of marital distress or satisfaction or intimacy. Here's some examples of some assessment tools. The family assessment device, or the FAD, the family adaptability and cohesion scale, and the Kansas marital satisfaction scale. All of these will help us get a better understanding of what the family or the couple looks like and can give us some added information for treating the eating disorder. This is the end of this lecture. I hope you were able to understand what assessment is and why it's important, and how it's important to use the family in assessment, as well as look at other areas besides just the eating disorder behavior.